Well, welcome to another episode of the Addy Hour. As always, I've enjoyed hosting these conversations and enjoy having conversations with my guests on this program. But today I'm extra excited for this, this uh, specific program and specific topic we'll be covering and also very excited about the guests who's joining. So today we'll be talking about sleep, emotional wellness, and mental health, something which I think all of us can relate to. And I'm honored to be able to host Dr. Obo Addy on the podcast, the original Dr. Addy, uh, in a sense. So obviously you can tell I'm excited about this and really um, grateful for his willingness to jump in and to be able to share um, so many important tips with all of us. So by way of introduction, Dr. Obo Addy is currently a sleep physician at the University of Michigan Health West. He also has an appointment as a clinical associate professor in the departments of medicine and psychiatry at Michigan State University. He's had previous positions at places like Case Western Reserve University, also at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta. And he's someone who has been deeply involved in both psychiatry and sleep medicine for over 30 years, so has expertise on both sides of the aisle, so to speak, and their intersection between the two. He's a husband. He's also a father of four children and a grandfather of five. And he's someone who continues to be invested in many different ways in the community through his church, but has also done things in the broader community, even in his semi-retired state right now, He's been involved in setting up sleep clinics in Ghana for the past several years, and so has continued to make sure um, that the expertise that he has and what he's been able to bring to the community and to different fields of medicine continues to have impact in lives. So I'm grateful to be able to welcome him today. Just as a uh, little bit of a full circle, I remember growing up and watching him on a CNN interview where he was talking about his work and being very proud and all inspired. So it's full circle for me to be able to host him on my own podcast and grateful to welcome Dr. Obo Addy to the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. And I'm, I'm just excited to be able to move this conversation in a lot of ways. And this has been something that's been in the back of my mind for a while. Just the benefits that I've had growing up with you and all the insights that you've shared with us over the years. So as you, mm -hmm. as you were, the, the phones, I'm reminded of the picture you took when you agreed to be a guinea pig for the, all the electrodes <laughs> I put on your head and things for a sleep recording as I was testing a new machine. That's true. Maybe that's what piqued my interest initially, even though I think at the time I was trying to revolt in my mind and go far away from your field, which I was very unsuccessful at. <laughs> at some point, we have to find that picture if you have it. Yes. Yes. I know I have it someplace. I'll look for it. Excellent. Well, as my listeners know, um, I always like to just check in and see how my guests are doing overall. So just with all the different things that you're doing in your semi-retirement, with your family responsibilities, even the ways that you've helped my family out in the last few weeks and the sleep clinic that you're doing in Ghana, how is everything in, in your own life, especially in the midst of the, uh, the ongoing pandemic? Well, COVID affects everything. It did affect the planned trips to Ghana. But on a personal level, one of the things I found a little disruptive was the most recent trip to Ghana, actually the last two, one in April and another in July. Mm -hmm. And what you have to go through with COVID testing, that within a two, three week period, I had to have, have three COVID tests, which are not pleasant. So then there's one test 72 hours before the flight. And then when you get to Ghana, you have a rapid test at the airport and you stay there for the result before you can leave the mm. airport. And then when you are coming back, you have to have another COVID test. So for me, having three COVID tests <laughs> in a two, three week period was not very pleasant. But to put it in perspective, I mean, I had the understanding, the reason for this, it's for my own health and for the mm. health of others. And I think a lot of people are going through this where there is some discomfort or annoyance about some of the things that we have to go through. But I think we have to be open to accepting these inconveniences for the overall good. So that's that's my personal experience with COVID and how to deal with it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it sounds like these weren't the um, the, the the painless tests. It sounds like you had the deeper swabs and all that as well. And Yes, and the very first one that I had, I said it's like somebody's trying to poke a needle into the base of your oh, brain. <laughs> Wow, that 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 is saying something for you as a psychiatrist to use that <laughs> that analogy as well. But I think you, you said it well too in terms of just people being willing to have the inconveniences for their own health and for those around them as well. How are things? Not to jump too far ahead, but how are things in Ghana when you went as well in terms of 
people's perspectives about COVID and a willingness to kind of abide by some of these um, practices and things like that? People have been fairly accepting. I mean, you, there are no overt protests. Um, there, are, there are people who are uncomfortable, but mm-hmm. as opposed to maybe things we see in the Western part of the world, people are more accepting of what the government's position on things is. Mm. I think it's, it's because of, of the, maybe the traditional way of things and the way things are set up that people look up more to authority in a lot mm. of ways or to the elders. So the president, in a sense, is the most senior elder for the country. So mm. he says this is good for us, although people may not like it. They mm. are generally accepting and people are wearing their masks. I mean, there are people who are not following the rules, but but by and large, people are accepting and mm. recognizing that there is a problem going on. There's a pandemic and people want to see it control. Oh, that's encouraging to hear. And it seems like with that role with the elders too, there's the um there's two sides to that because there's the earn there's the respect that's there, but then it seems like it also has to be kept as well and not used in a way that that actually is harmful to people. So there's a lot of weight there as well in some ways. And maybe that's what has led to some of the dictatorships in the African continent. That because mm-hmm. of their respect for elders, yeah, some of these leaders have abused that privilege. And and we've seen dictators there, unfortunately. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And it's encouraging to hear that things are in that moving in that way now, at least in Ghana, in a lot of ways. It actually um, leads to the next question, just thinking about your profession um, as someone in sleep medicine as well, because I know, obviously, personally, from your your trajectory and your path going into psychiatry, there were aspects that came up initially in terms of whether that was whether that was um, favored by the government, the types of work you're doing and how it was looked upon and how that shaped your own path. So I think it would be helpful for our listeners if you could share how you got into psychiatry and sleep medicine in the first place. And I guess the intersection between your personal story and the role of the government as much as you're willing to share. Yeah, I think God gives us different interests and affinities for certain things. So I don't know that I can pinpoint what led to my interest in psychiatry, but there was a very early interest in the things of the mind and Mm -hmm. how that works. And I think that also relates to my Christian faith and background as to what God is doing. And it's not just all the things you can measure that much. So there was an initial interest in psychiatry, but in medical school in Ghana, that was downplayed. The idea was we have big problems with infectious diseases and other things. Mm -hmm. And why would anyone want to focus on psychiatry, that is not that important. So for me, the whole thing came more to light when I was doing my rural service in Ghana. That, And as a general medical practitioner, you are doing everything that one year or two years out of medical school, doing everything means I was doing things like hernia surgeries. And one of the most satisfying was doing emergency cesarean sections mm. and to have a healthy mother and a healthy baby afterwards. But then what struck me as I was running a clinic there was that there were people who were coming in, especially some of the women from maybe abusive families Mm. who repeatedly would be at the clinic seeking some care. And there was no physical care or need at that point. It quickly became obvious to me that these people had emotional problems that nobody was dealing with. And they were coming to the clinic and coming to the doctor for help. But then the thing that maybe promoted more the interest to pursue my interest in psychiatry was this. I knew how to handle most medical emergencies. I knew how to treat routine things like the malaria. Like I said, I could handle emergency here in your office. I could handle emergency cesarean sections. I had no idea how to handle any psychiatric emergencies. Mm. So it struck me that there was this clear need there. And although this had been downplayed, what my professors were saying was not really accurate, that there was no need, there was a huge need. So Mm. then that led me to follow the interest and the affinity that I say God had given me to go into a field that will help those who are emotionally distressed and needed help. Yeah, that's encouraging to hear. And how? so how did you take those steps if the avenue wasn't, clear in a sense, if the president wasn't there also. Yeah, so then I did talk to, well, he was actually an uncle by marriage who was a psychiatrist who I Mm -hmm. looked up to. 
So I asked him how one would do this. So he did encourage me, but then he said, well, you may have a glorified idea of what psychiatry is. So why don't you get a clear idea? So he invited me to work with him for some time attached to the main psychiatric hospital uh, in the capital, in Accra. Mm. And this was the old type asylum. Mm. Like, I mean, there were good rooms, but then some of them were basically being uh, put there just for custodial care. And there mm. wasn't much good treatment. In a sense, he opened my eyes to see maybe the worst part of it. Mm -hmm. But instead of what well, he said, if you want to go into this, you want to see the true picture. Mm -hmm. But that heightened my interest rather than dumping it. And I felt like, well, this is something that I was willing to do. So he did encourage me along the way, but there was no avenue for going to psychiatry and to make things a little bit more interesting. The head of surgery had developed an interest in me. And I suppose I was good with my hands with surgical interest. So he invited mm. me to go into surgery and I was going to have full sponsorship mm. to do that. And there was no avenue for going to psychiatry. And yet I felt like this is what God was calling me to do. Mm. So when the chief of surgery asked me, invited me to come into surgery, I was forced to make a decision then. I did write to him to say, no, I'm not going to surgery. I want to go into psychiatry. And he reacted like, why would anyone <laughs> choose to go into psychiatry, especially since there was no clear path for me to mm -hmm. get there. Mm -hmm. And there was a clear, easy path for me to become a surgeon. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I did talk to my uncle and then they said a whole long story. But then the steps fell into place and I did end up going to psychiatric training at Duke where the young man who is interviewing me went to school. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> full, that's another whole long story. Full circle in many ways. So it's always, I mean, I always feel like I learn more each time I hear this story. So it's also encouraging to hear your willingness to follow the passion, even though others weren't necessarily supportive in that sense. And then how did the sleep part become integrated into the story? Yes, it's in a sense, as I was thinking about this, it's the same kind of a story in terms of the human interest, the need to help others. Like I said, I was in this rural medicine and these ladies were coming in and they had psychiatric needs that nobody was dealing with, that nobody knew what to do about. It was in my first year of training uh, at Duke that a patient come in, came in and I labeled him the lazy farmer. So. So this guy belonged to a farming family and mm -hmm. he was always sleepy and tired and he would get on the tractor and his brothers would see him out in the middle of the field sleeping on the tractor and they said he was lazy. I mean, he didn't like to work like his brothers. Mm -hmm. Then somebody thought, well, maybe he had some medical problem. Maybe it was a seizure problem or some other thing. So mm -hmm. he was brought to Duke for a full workup and it was in the workup that my Professor then, the person who was training me in, in EEG. I was in the psychiatric program, but I was doing the EEG training, which mm. uh, was combined with it. And he said, maybe this guy has sleep apnea. Maybe he's not lazy after all. And that was the first I heard of anything like sleep apnea. Mm. But to not make it a long story, he, he did have a workup. There were not established sleep clinics then but he had worked up subsequently he had treatment. But that thing stuck in my mind. This guy had a genuine medical sleep problem. Mm -hmm. It was labeled by family and friends as lazy. So the thought was how many other so-called mm. lazy farmers are there who need help, mm. who nobody's giving the help to. Mm. So that's what I'm saying. Maybe in a sense, as I was looking at this, we have our own way of processing things. So there's the rural, people, psychiatric patients in Ghana, nobody was taken care of. Mm -hmm. How many are there that needed help? Then there's a lazy farmer. How many more are mm -hmm. there lazy, how many more lazy farmers are there who need help? Mm -hmm. So again, the interest was going to this thing, if you can, to try and help people with that. But it didn't mean that I went directly into that. I mean, I had the interest there, but there was no avenue to follow it. Again, this looks like the same story before. It was years after I had left Duke that I was working elsewhere, where an old professor from Duke 
came to give grand rounds. Mm. And he says, we want to develop a sleep program. I mean, he was at everything. And I know your background that you were combining psychiatry and EEG things. And I think you'll be an ideal person to help us get a program going. So it was an invitation. And mm. then, so I didn't realize that this interest was known to any others, but <laughs> obviously it had become known to others. Mm. So then I did pick up where I had left off, so to speak, and that's how I came into sleep. Mm. It's a long way to say it, but I hope that. No, that's good. And it seems like some of the, the passion was there, but you didn't necessarily have the opportunity initially. And then it still came from an invitation later on that you're able to take advantage of, which seems really important. It's also interesting hearing the story because it, in the sleep side, it seems to parallel a lot of what's happened with mental health in this country and globally as people have had better awareness and trying not to label people as just, you know, the aunt or uncle who's a little bit off or this and that, but with the same thing with sleep because the farmer was just being labeled as lazy without a true awareness of the, do you think that's moved over the years or are people still, are there still things people are unaware of in terms of sleep and how sleep problems can affect our daily lives? I think it's improved a lot. I mean, a lot from, yeah, even when I started, I was, yeah, in the early phases about 30 years ago, but when we moved to Grand Rapids, a clinic maybe about 20 years ago, and one of my colleagues, there were three of us that started my basic training in psychiatry. Then there was a neurologist and then a pulmonologist. And it's the pulmonologist who had the hardest time. I mean, 20 years ago, a lot of his colleagues were making statements. I mean, you went to medical school and you spent mm. time specializing in pulmonology. And now you want to do sleep medicine. It's <laughs> like you're giving up all your medical training. What is sleep medicine? Why would mm. you want to do that? So there's a huge move from that. Mm. So I think there's greater understanding even compared to 20 years ago. So it's good to see that. Yeah, that's really important. What do you think, um, what do you think about the understanding? Because we talked about from the medical perspective, what about in the general public? Do people have more of an awareness or do you, is there still this lazy farmer attitude that happens when people are struggling with, with disturbed sleep? Yeah, I think even the general public, there's a greater awareness of this and a greater understanding. You still hear, I mean, as recently as maybe two, three years ago, I've had a parent call a child with narcolepsy lazy and mm -hmm. it became yeah, a conflictual situation where mother was more accepting that there was a need and all father would think of, no, he's lazy. It's not like his brothers. If he mm -hmm. were, he would yeah, do wow. such and such. Yeah, but again, it's it's moved. So there is general awareness has, has improved. But it still needs to move forward. This past week, I read something that the NIH has given, a, is giving a three-year grant to the Academy of Sleep Medicine to work on increasing the awareness of mm. sleep. So there's a recognition, there's a need to do more public education on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it seems important just in terms of every aspect of, of our of our lives is how important sleep is. Um, so I'm also curious just, you know, for our listeners as well, what are some of the things that you usually tell people when people are trying to understand what, what is, cause I've heard you use the term sleep hygiene before, what does good sleep hygiene look like? And also how do people know if it's a sleep disturbance that they're dealing with or if it's something else and how do they know when to get help? Yes, yeah, sleep hygiene refers to yeah, things that you can do to promote your sleep, but there is maybe to, back up on what are the important components of sleep, mm. okay? There is, sometimes people will say, well, is the quality of my sleep? If I sleep well, I have good quality sleep, then it doesn't matter if it's three hours or four hours, but there are things that we know about sleep. Sleep duration is extremely important. So, and we can talk about this later as well. That sleep duration alone, regardless of quality, if it's not adequate duration, can lead to major health problems. So mm. one of the things that we need to know about sleep is that we need to get enough of it. Mm. And we can cheat with it. It has consequences if we do not get enough. And then the other component is sleep continuity. It's preferable to get all of our sleep in one block as much as possible. When I've talked to medical groups, well, especially when I was in Ghana the last time, and then young physicians will say, well, I'm on call some of the time, but what if I get two hours of sleep 
now and then I'm away for the next four hours and get another two hours and then I get an hour and a half someplace. Even if you have the same total duration, if you get eight hours of sleep, but it's broken up into three or four pieces with one or two hour intervals, mm. as opposed to seven hours, I'll use that as an example, seven hours of continuous sleep. Seven hours of more continuous sleep is more refreshing and has better health consequences than a total of eight hours of sleep broken oh. up into five or six segments. Mm. So the duration is important and getting consecutive hours of sleep is important. Then you ask about sleep hygiene there. This refers to the poor habits that can make your sleep quality less than adequate. So things like reading in bed, especially if you are reading on an electronic device, mm. it may be a low light intensity, but that kind of thing can still affect your sleep. It can delay sleep onset. Things like stimulants or even drinking coffee and drinking coffee in the evening can affect it. So those are the things you want to uh, guard against. Keeping a regular sleep-wake pattern is important. And again, if it's irregular, it will be more harmful than good. But there is a component that most people don't recognize, which I think is important. Some people will say, go to bed at the same time and get up at the same time. But the important thing is to fix your wake up time. Mm. And the bedtime, in a sense, will take care of itself or the sleep onset. It's easy to remember this if you look at it this way. You can make yourself wake up, but you cannot make yourself fall asleep. Mm. But what people sometimes do, especially if they're having some difficulty with their sleep onset, will say, if I get into bed at 10, then I'll turn regularly, then I'll fall asleep by 11 or something like that. But if you have problems falling asleep and you get into bed when you are not sleepy, your level of anxiety can increase. And mm. the longer you're in bed, the longer you get, the, mm. the more anxious you get and the more difficult it becomes to sleep. So fix your wake up time and try not to sleep too much during the day. We can talk about that later too. And then when it comes to nighttime, you're, but it will take care of that part. Mm. So avoid stimulants at night, maintaining good regular rhythm for other things, even including your meals. Good regular exercise would help and avoiding long periods of sleep during the day. These are some of the components of sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene itself would not cure a significant sleep problem, mm -hmm. but maintaining those habits can be helpful. Yeah, those are all really, really good uh, tips. Do you ever get... Um, push back from people because I can imagine people say oh but I have this and this and this to do or this job situation or this circumstance and that's not feasible so what do I do if I can't get all of those things in place what if I can't get a consistent wake up time or or you know family responsibilities or infants at night that's a whole another topic but how, how do you help people in those situations yeah I think it's one can use as a same approach you use for anything else and that yeah, somebody has diabetes, so they have to watch their diet and things. But every so often, a circumstance comes up where mm. they cannot follow that. Yeah, so you can break from that on a short-term basis, but mm. not on a long-term consistent basis. Yeah, so you are going through this. Somebody has a baby, baby is waking up at night. Well, there's, you need to be up to help your baby. So there's not a whole lot you can do about that. But as soon as possible, you want to get back to the good ongoing consistent practices. Mm. These are all things that you want to be doing on a long-term ongoing basis. And it's important to keep those in mind. Yes. Yeah. But when it comes to sleep hygiene, even people who have significant difficulties, usually as soon as you begin to mention it, a lot of patients will say, no, I've done all of that and it doesn't mm. work. Mm. But almost always when you delve into it, you can see that there's a significant component they are not following. Mm. One big component is a daytime nap. Okay. I often say there's a good way to take a nap and a not so good way to take a nap. A good nap is one that is more in the middle of the day mm. because it's a natural dip in the middle of the day. A good nap is one that is generally no more than an hour long and it's maybe a half hour to an hour will be sufficient. But what some people do who have significant problems is they are following these things, but then they don't get a good night. And then 
they more or less crash, as they put it. Mm. And then they will sleep for four hours, one mm. after, just to make up. But that throws things off. So they think again, go back to a regular rhythm and follow the good guidelines for a nap. Don't go for days without adequate sleep and then sleep for four or four, five hours during mm. the day on some, some, some day. So That's really so helpful. Consistency is important. Yeah, and it's the way you're sharing the stories, it seems like a lot of times people are just using their own best educated guess to try and address things, but that might not necessarily be what's best for the situation. Exactly, exactly. So that, that's helpful to hear. I'm sure people are, I imagine people are taking notes or even <laughs> thinking about ways to apply these pieces as well. Um, I was also just going to ask about insomnia, just because anecdotally, just talking to people, there are so many people that say they have problems falling asleep at certain times of their lives and how... Are those rates changing over time or are people just more aware of those sleep disturbances? Yeah, I would say people are more aware because it's the, the study showed that about 10% of people have significant insomnia. And mm. this is long time. I mean, 10% is, is the big number. That has been more or less stable. And then when we talk about insomnia, many would tend to focus on the difficulty of falling asleep in the first place. Mm -hmm. But by definition, that's not all there is. Some may fall asleep easily, but have difficulty maintaining sleep. So mm -hmm. the difficulty maintaining sleep is also a problem. Or there are those that wake up too early, and that is insomnia too. Mm -hmm. okay. It's important in the definition though to add the third component. It's not just difficulty falling off to sleep or maintaining sleep, but it's associated with some impairment in daytime functioning. That is important because it's a, it's a lady, during my training in sleep medicine, this lady came in and she was quite distressed because she had insomnia. So then we asked the question, so do you have difficulty falling off to sleep? She says, no. Do you have difficulty staying asleep? She says, no. Mm -hmm. And when you wake up in the morning, do you feel refreshed? She says, yes. But I'm getting about six and a half hours of sleep, six to seven, I think. But everybody in my family sleeps about eight to nine hours. So I'm insomnia because I have few hours of sleep. But mm -hmm. the hours is not everything. So mm -hmm. insomnia means you have difficulty falling asleep or maintaining sleep, and you also have some daytime consequences to mm -hmm. consequence to it. So if you are sleeping fewer hours than the rest of your family, but you feel perfectly fine and you feel mm -hmm. perfectly refreshed, then by definition, you do not have insomnia. Oh, wow. okay. So I think it's important. It's not the number, it's mm -hmm. the things that go with it. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe I div deviated from what your question was, but- I that, Yeah, that's helpful as well. Cause I know just talking with people, people from different families have said, oh, you know, well, some people in my family sleep four or five hours and they went in for all the sleep studies to see is there something that, but they said they've been functioning fine. And so eventually they were just told that that was how they operate. But then, you know, they interact with others and people think, oh, what's wrong with you? Why are you only sleeping four hours a night? That can't be healthy. So what you shared is definitely helpful for that perspective as well. Yes. But it's also important to add that there are some who claim that all they need mm. is four or five hours of sleep. The thing is that we said the general rule is most people, the academy stands by the seven to nine hours of sleep is adequate sleep. Mm. All the studies show that when you are more or less consistently getting less than six hours of sleep, there can be major consequences. Mm. And this includes consequences like daytime sleepiness or tiredness. There can be cognitive impairment. You are mm. not as sharp as you should be. And sometimes people do not recognize it. As mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll say, if somebody is an A student or A plus student and is performing at a B plus level, I mean, it's not, people will say that's acceptable too. Mm -hmm. But if you're an A plus person functioning at B plus level, you're actually not functioning at your peak and mm -hmm. you don't recognize it. So, mm -hmm. so things like generally less than six hours of sleep can be an impairment your risk of cardiovascular consequences mm. is higher. Mm. Your immunity level is higher. Studies have been done. There's one that struck me, came out recently. Just a common cold mm. that, and people who were sleeping less than six hours of sleep, I mean, didn't ask them to change anything, just mm. selected groups. 
and those who are getting adequate sleep seven to nine hours. Those sleeping less than six hours of sleep generally, and mm. they are healthy. When the two groups are exposed to the common cold virus, mm -hmm. those who sleep less than six hours have a full fourfold increased risk of getting the cold, mm. as opposed wow. to those who sleep adequately. I see that as important these days of COVID. Nobody has studied that. Mm. But if you are cons sleeping consistently less, are you at greater risk of mm. getting COVID? We don't know that, but we know that people have a higher risk, like I said, a heart attack. They have a higher risk of developing other medical consequences. So we should take insomnia seriously. It does mm -hmm. have consequences. We are talking about mental health, where I say my background is mental health too. We know that those with long-standing, long-term insomnia have a greater risk of developing depression or mm -hmm. having anxiety problems. Mm -hmm. Those with depression are more likely to have insomnia, but those mm -hmm. with insomnia are also more likely to develop depression. And sometimes people feel like insomnia is just my problem or mm -hmm. I can just deal with it on my own. But there are times that it does need to be looked at uh, professionally and managed. So yeah, yeah long, long answers to short questions. But, but all, all very good and very helpful. And I'm sure, uh, again, I'm sure that this is something that's very, that people are, just thinking about, because I'm sure in people's own lives or in people they interact with, there are lots of things they may have noticed that they've never really heard talked about as fully um, before. So it's really helpful to have that as well. And it makes me think about what you said about the public uh, conversations and the emphasis on that in the next three years. I think that's that's very important as well. And how do you, I mean, even I was thinking about what you were saying about people, you know, operating at a lower level than they, that might not be their peak performance. How do how do you help people realize that? Because if someone has been in that, what if someone's been operating at a B plus for 10 years and that's the norm, do you leave it that way? Do you help them to try and adjust to, to improve their quality of life or how, how does that conversation get started? Yeah, it's difficult to convince people when they don't see the evidence on their own. So mm. we, we talk about insomnia, I'll shift to something else out. The lazy farmer had sleep apnea. So I'll mm -hmm. talk a little bit about sleep apnea at this point. Sleep apnea is when you see some of the most dramatic changes and addresses this question about functioning at the B plus level instead of A plus level. You see somebody who comes in, they have loud snoring. They have some tiredness and sleepiness during the day, often, this is common in men. So the man comes in, not because he thinks he has a problem, but because he's tired of his wife complaining that <laughs> he's snoring so loudly, she's not getting good enough sleep. He comes in, he has a sleep study, a diagnosis of sleep apnea is made. He gets active treatment for that. One of the most common treatments is the CPAP, continuous positive pressure device that he wears. And it's, maybe surprising or amazing, or maybe not. But, but people will come back and they said, I should have done this 10 years ago. Mm. Because all this time, so I thought it's just my age, that because now I'm 45 or 50, that's why I'm not, I've not been as sharp. But you treat a sleep apnea and mm. this goes away. So that's when they recognize it. it's mm. extremely difficult to convince people they mm. are functioning at a lower level. So they see themselves. Mm. So that. The goal is not so much to convince them that they will function at a higher level, but to say, this we know is a problem. This is a medical condition, mm -hmm. or if it's insomnia, if it's mm -hmm. the sleep apnea. So let's treat it and see what happens. And I mm -hmm. often offer people, let's give it a try. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens. Another thought comes to mind. It's, I say, I love to be proven wrong in terms mm -hmm. of my clinical work. <laughs> so a lady comes in, she's averaging about 20 cups of coffee a day. <laughs> And she's saying she has insomnia and she needs help. And I said, well, you talk about a sleep hygiene. One of the first things you can do is to try and cut back down on how much coffee you are drinking per day. And she wasn't convinced it mm. would make any difference. But these were own words when she came back for her first follow-up. She says, I decided to do this to prove you wrong. <laughs> I was sure it wasn't going to make any difference, but I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just cut back. I cut back to half my consumption and I'll go back to this doctor and I'll just show you how wrong it is. She comes back and she's surprised. She's surprised at the doctor. 
So this is why I said, no, it's it's great to be proven wrong mm -hmm. uh, on this. Okay, it's, I like telling story. So then there is going back to sleep apnea. I see a 70 year old guy, he's about 70. And sleep apnea can present in unusual ways. For some men, of, it can cause you to go to the bathroom a lot, four, mm -hmm. five, six times at night. And this was this patient's major problem. So he goes to see a urologist and the urologist says, no, your prostate is fine. In spite mm. of your age, we don't need to do anything there. He comes to the sleep clinic and he's upset. And he says, my doctor is a good doctor, which is why I follow through. But I think it's wrong. What does waking up a lot to go to the bathroom at night have to do with sleep? Mm. It's, it's my waking up that is disturbing my sleep. He should fix that, then I'll be mm. fine. But he says I should be at the sleep clinic. So I'm here. Or oh, in the way you put it, I know it's my age and it's my prostate. Mm. I can't do anything about my age. If you fix the prostate, I'll be fine. Anyway, he goes through the sleep study. He has confirmed sleep apnea. He gets treated. He comes back for his first follow-up. That's about six weeks later. And he's saying, strange thing that happened. He forgot some of our discussion. Now I wake up only once to go to the mm. bathroom. So then I asked him, did the urologist decide to do your prostate? Mm. He says, no. And then I asked him, maybe, okay. so I said, are you still 70 years old? And he looks like me. <laughs> what is he talking about? I said, you told me it was your age and your prostate. Your prostate is still there and you are still 70. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so well, it's a, again, a long way to mm. answer this question that you cannot really convince people mm -hmm until after they've had the treatment. So the goal is to try somehow to get them to agree to the treatment. And mm. often we'll phrase it that this is a test. Let's do it. You don't lose anything about the worst is you lose the copay for the workup and the test. Mm. And if you prove me wrong, that's fine. But yeah, so. Yeah, well, it's, it's, not, it's interesting because it sounds like you're using some of the uh, psychological tools as well to get people to... Uh... <laughs> To go through it and experience it, and then and then see um, the outcome. But it sounds like it's so. Um, I mean, it's so transformative in a lot of ways. Um, but I guess the other question is because as you were talking, it seems that also within the medical community, people have to be aware. So the fact that the urologist actually sent the patient to the sleep clinic was also important. Do you think that's something that's uniform across the board, or is there? Are there disparities that come up in terms of the access to care that people have and whether people are cognizant of that? And I mentioned that just because of some of the things that we talk about in terms of, you know, some of the systems in place in the U.S. and how that impacts different communities and communities of color in particular, and whether there's equal access to these services, especially around sleep, because as you mentioned, it has so many impacts on so many aspects of our health, just our physical health and our mental health. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of things. It's in terms of referrals. Unfortunately, there are still healthcare providers who are not paying enough attention mm -hmm. to sleep issues. I mean, the clinics that I've done in the past, and even in my current position, you often will see the same kinds of names or certain primary physicians have a lot of referrals coming through, mm -hmm. and some have almost none. So he mm. said, obviously, people with sleep problems are not pre-selecting who they would mm -hmm. see. So that would mean that there are some clinicians who are not paying enough attention to mm -hmm. send the patients. Access is a huge problem. Actually, I, just, I was looking at something this week, the morbidity and mortality weekly report from the CDC. Mm -hmm. The one from September 24th. So this, yeah, this past week. It was looking at sleep in children, mm -hmm. four months old to 17 years. So children are uh, adolescents. And it said about a third in that group, a third are not getting the adequate duration of sleep that they mm -hmm. need. And there mm -hmm. are regional differences. It's about 25% in Maine, about 49% in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And when you look at this, we say we do know that inadequate sleep has health consequences. But you see greater risk or higher prevalence in racial and ethnic minorities, and then in areas where the economic, socioeconomic 
people are at the bottom or the lower end of the mm. socioeconomic ladder. So these groups have higher prevalence rates of almost all sleep mm. disturbances, and they have lower rates of access. There's another thing that makes that even more distressing is this, that when it comes to the things like sleep apnea, if you have the same level, the consequences are often worse mm. in racial minorities. For So there are ethnic and racial differences. So if you have, for example, a Caucasian with a certain degree of sleep apnea, and there's a black person who has the same degree of sleep apnea, the chances that the black person, even with the same access, will mm. get more health consequences are higher. Mm. So yeah, so it's not equal. And the Academy of Sleep Medicine right now is trying to pay attention to that, to the racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic mm. disparity in the distribution and the availability of access to treatment for these mm. groups. So, yeah. yeah, that seems very important, especially because of the way that you phrase for all, because that seems like it will affect from all aspects of health for the, the individual's life. And so that just that in addition to everything else that has been discussed, obviously around health disparities, it seems like sleep is a huge part of that, which I don't hear talked about as much. And maybe that's just the circles that I'm in, but even in public discourse, it doesn't seem like that's often brought to the forefront, but it sounds like hopefully there are pushes to make sure that becomes a better part of understanding. Yes, like I said, the Academy of Sleep Medicine is working on it. Yeah, but it, within the general medical field, maybe it's, we are not getting enough attention on it. It's more recent the academy is pushing the whole area of the disparity in mm -hmm. the distribution. Mm -hmm. So first of all, in some of the groups, the social, lower social community groups, people may not recognize that there is a problem with sleep and maybe physicians or pro care providers in those places are not recognizing enough to encourage the people to mm -hmm. go. But then part of the thing, increase the level of awareness in primary care physicians. So mm -hmm. they will recognize this and treat it because some people are very far away from mm -hmm. any center, any sleep, established sleep disorder centers. But the mm -hmm. thing is to get primary care physicians to recognize the importance and to address it because there are mm -hmm. many, many things that primary care providers can, can do to help. Right. I'm curious if you ever see any resistance to that, because you talked about some of the patients that are resistant to it and don't realize it's an issue until you until they've tried to prove you wrong and they've seen it. Does that ever happen with the primary physicians in certain communities or even in the community? Because I'm thinking also about stigma, whether there's stigmas that are still coming into play as well. I know I asked several questions at once, but <laughs> yeah, no, but it's probably more difficult to with the primary care physicians because it's. I mean, for as long as we've done this in the community in which I am now, there are still some primary care physicians who almost never refer a patient. Mm. So, and, and the knowledge is there, you do educational programs and they attend these things, but maybe like everything else, yeah, it's because obviously the physician, even when they've had patients who have been treated, some, it looked like for some reason, some are still not convinced mm. that they still wouldn't, send patient. So in a sense, it's easier to convert, if you so to speak, the patient who has had a positive mm -hmm. experience than mm -hmm. the physician who does not recognize this. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a really good point. So people who are able to just share that in their communities as well. Yeah. Have you seen that happen in some ways or in some places, either here or in Ghana? Have you seen that the those who have actually gone through the experience as as patients? Have you seen them have impact in communities, either in the States or in Ghana? Yes, they have. Actually, when I started here in Grand Rapids, there one of my colleagues uh, used to say, this is a pulmonary, pulmonary physician whose friends were thinking he was leaving medicine by going mm -hmm. to sleep. Yeah, sleep. But then he always would encourage, he said, uh, our best promoters for the sleep clinic are the patients. Mm -hmm. So you treat a patient well. And actually, we do have a lot of patients who tell their family members and friends mm. and colleagues to come in. And the physicians sometimes become secondary. Mm. They will get a good treatment and they will tell the physician that, well, this is what I realize I have. My cousin needs to go to, can you, so can you refer my cousin to the mm. sleep clinic? So <laughs> sometimes yeah, it's the patient who drives it. Yeah, so mm. the patients drive this in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. 
not so much in Ghana and I've started a relationship with Nigeria. I recently learned you can leave your country and forget the culture. Mm. In that culture, you don't talk about your health problems. So then I've seen patients, and actually this last video, somebody actually told me, I'm not going to let anyone know. Mm. So the Ghanaian patient, even when they've had a positive response, mm. I'm not going to share that information with anyone else. Mm. So yes, patients drive the growth of the clinic here, but in a different culture, that, that doesn't work. So yeah. then you have to work through the, the primary physicians. Like we said, again, the role of authority in that context. So mm -hmm. it's going to be more important in that context to convince the physicians to send patients. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, the patients can refer themselves or convince their doctors to send them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, well, it seems a lot just being aware of just the, the culture within, like you said, that it's, it's operating and the systems in place. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And, and obviously when it comes to sleep, there are various sleep disorders. I think you had a question of when does one treat it on their own and mm -hmm. when do you seek help from a professional? A lot of people with insomnia would try and manage on their own. But, and there's habits and there are behavior things you can do to improve things. We talk about the sleep hygiene and there are more specific things. But even if we've done all of these the usual things you know, and they are not working. Mm -hmm. It's important then to seek professional help because mm -hmm. of the consequences of untreated insomnia or excessive sleepiness. Sleep apnea and some of the conditions that cause excessive sleepiness can be dangerous because people can get to the point of falling asleep driving, which mm -hmm. puts the person at risk and puts others on the road at risk as well. So that's an insomnia thing. If it's not improving, you should avoid taking sleeping pills on a long-term basis. Mm -hmm. A sleeping pill ha may have a place in managing short-term insomnia problems. But if you are taking, whatever you are taking, if you see the dose going up, the dose keeps climbing and the mm -hmm. effectiveness is decreasing, that may be one indication to see someone. For those who have problems with snoring, and begin to develop daytime sleepiness. The snoring itself may not necessarily mean you have a sleep apnea mm -hmm. or major sleep problem. But if there is disruption of your sleep, you don't feel as refreshed when you wake up in the morning, or you are beginning to have some daytime sleepiness, or in terms of the sleep apnea, if whoever is sleeping with you or who, anyone who has observed you sleeping comments that it looks like your breathing gets interrupted at night, mm -hmm then you want to yeah, seek professional help for that because that's when you need a sleep study to clarify what is going on. Again, it's because of the consequences. Risk of getting a stroke is higher. Risk of getting a heart attack is higher. Mm. The cognitive in impairment can come on slowly, but it can mm. be significant. Again, this is one of those things that people will recover and go back to work. We are, we relate this to faith as well. So then the example of a pastor comes to mind who had sleep apnea and didn't recognize it. Mm. Things were not prominent, but it was after he got treated that he said, oh, so this is why I was getting to the point I was having difficulty preparing my sermons. Mm. I mean, Saturday I work on it and then I'm standing in the pulpit and my things were not clicking. And I mm. thought, well, there's a spiritual thing. I'm not praying enough and things. Mm. No, his sleep apnea was not treated. So his <laughs> brain was not functioning. I didn't yeah. Know. So, yeah, so when things are not improving that you've tried on your own, then it's time to see a professional to see yeah. what's going on. Those are really helpful, really helpful tips as well. And I'm sure, again, that people, this is going to, these are things that people are going to be thinking. Like you said, someone who said, I wish I had known this 10 years earlier and those types of things. So I appreciate you sharing those. I'm also curious, though, because you talked about how sleep affects overall health and then how it affects mental health. Um, and then if people have a higher prevalence for depression or anxiety because of sleep disturbances or the other way around, how do you advise people what to tackle first? So, I mean, if they're noticing that they're having some challenges with anxiety, but also having challenges with sleep, like where should people go to try and address that? Are there parts they should try and do on their own? Is, do they have to go? Because there's also a challenge of, well, how many different providers do they have to go to to deal with the intersections? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, as a general rule, it's always good to start with your primary care provider 
and whether it's anxiety or the sleep thing. Anxiety can be so disabling, and anxiety in the depression. And I would say that it's, it will make sense to approach the anxiety or depression uh, initially. Mm. From the standpoint of both counseling kinds of treatment, as well as medication kinds of treatment, you would expect that, and I think most of it, the primary provider who addresses the depression and anxiety, if they are using counseling or the psychologist, will give input that will probably impact positively on the sleep mm. as well. Mm. But when it comes to medication management, many, I was going to say most, but that's in the past, things have changed, but still many antidepressant medications and medications for anxiety have an effect on promoting sleep as well. Mm. Mm. So the single agent can address both the depression oh, wow. and the sleep. So that is a place to start. But if the depression and anxiety are improving and the sleep is still not improving enough, then you may mm -hmm. consider going to a sleep clinic. Mm. But if the major problem is something like snoring or the sleep is so extreme that somebody cannot function during the day and, and a lot of patients will be able to identify which is more prominent. Mm. And the sleep is more disabling, it's more mm. significant. It may not be critical where you start from. Most sleep clinic, clinicians are aware of the depression and anxiety component of things. So when you see them and they say, well, this is not so much the sleep, it's more the anxiety and depression. There's an interesting thing here, the stigma about mental illness is decreasing, but it's still there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And there are many people who prefer to go to the sleep clinic first. Mm, okay. Not because that's the most part, but that's more acceptable. Mm -hmm. A sleep problem is it's funny the way. A sleep problem is a medical biological problem. Mm. But a <laughs> mental illness problem is non-medical. It's it's mm. your mind, it's doing something, and it's that's not as acceptable to most people. Mm. And Again, in the faith community, there has been, again, it's proving that if you have a mental health problem, then it's a lack of faith mm. or it's your poor decision making or it's your poor choices. Mm. That is what is causing it. That may not necessarily be so, but as I was thinking about this, it doesn't mean that it's your fault, although you may have something to do with it. In the mm. same way that somebody's eating habits in their lifestyle may promote their risk of developing diabetes, mm. type 2 diabetes. So somebody's poor choices and poor habits may lead to a sleep problem or a mental health problem. But on the other hand, there can be somebody who develops type 1 but diabetes. The mm. child who develops childhood diabetes may have done all the right things. There are some mm. things we inherit. So we should look at both the same way. You can develop diabetes even when you've done all the right things. Mm. But you can develop diabetes because you've some, done some wrong thing. Mm. So in the mental health arena, there's no reason we should look at it any differently. You can develop a sleep problem when you've done all the right things. Mm. But you can also develop a sleep problem because you haven't done the right things. So mm. it's important to pay attention to that because I think we run the risk sometimes of excusing people because mm. we want to look at the biological end of no, it has nothing to do with what you did. It's it's all just biological. It's mm. the holistic idea mm -hmm. of things. And again, you uh, asked me this, you ask it. The whole thing about where does faith come comes mm -hmm. in? God made us one. I mean, you are we have the physical component of ourselves, our emotional component, our spiritual component, and we like to separate the different mm -hmm. parts of it. It should be all one whole thing. Mm -hmm. And in all of these areas it may be predetermined or nothing we did wrong. Mm. But in some of the areas or in all of the areas, it may be something we need to do right. Because I think sometimes we excuse people. No, you didn't do anything wrong. Well, maybe wrong is not the right <laughs> term. But mm. no, there's some, you have some responsibility. There are mm -hmm. some things you probably didn't do as well and some things you can improve to change things. So, so I shouldn't go on, then I'll become like I'm preaching. <laughs> Well, that was uh, so well said. I mean, just all the different components that you you've brought in together, um, especially about the holistic approach to these things. So I think it's it's not easy, but important for us to continue to to wrestle through 
And of course, even as you're talking, I'm seeing where some of my own influences and thinking came from because you could be hosting this podcast with those themes and just all the things that you incorporate. So it's a good um, reminder to me also of the example that you've set in your profession, how that is something that I've been able to also carry out from you without even realizing how much of that actually might have originated um, with you or those that it influenced you as well. So, I mean, I think it's very well said, just all the different components that we have to think about versus um, just trying to put things in one box or another, because they're all interplaying. I mean, even as you were talking, the people are saying, well, this is because of your own poor decision-making that you have this health ailment or the sleep issue. But then you also said that the sleep can lead to poor decision-making. So it seems like those two can't be divorced and it's really important to help people. Have you seen, as a closing question, have you seen us as a society get better about moving towards what you just stated for that holistic approach? Or are there, I mean, clearly there's, there's still ways we need to grow on that, but have you seen it shifting or are we still far from where we need to be? Yes, no, I think there's a definite shift. Okay, and and you are an example of that. Okay, mm-hmm. so the. When we're doing this Duke, when we started doing faith and health, it was on the side. It mm. wasn't part of the program. And it, mm. and there was a lot of resistance to that. I mean, it's you know, 30 years ago, I mean, 40 years ago, no university will be hosting this. <laughs> no university will want yeah. its name attached to what we are doing now. Mm. So. So it's it's moved it's moved a lot and it's mm-hmm. good to to see that yeah so it's I mean we still have ways to go and there are still areas to develop but no as I look at you I say where your influences come from well it's 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 interesting but as I'm looking at you doing this I feel like well you are doing so much greater work than I ever did and I don't see myself as <laughs> doing a whole lot so so we are very thankful no but mm. we've made broad progress and. Mm. I think we'll continue to make progress. And it's more open and it's mm-hmm. more the forum, the things you've done with the town hall meetings. Again, these were done on a small scale basis. So we are way ahead of where we were uh, 20, 30 years ago, even mm-hmm. 10 years ago. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, we are making progress, but we shouldn't just stop now, mm-hmm. and say where we've achieved our goal, where, mm-hmm. as Paul says, we keep striving to mm-hmm. for the goal and we are not there yet. And, we, we, so long as we live, we need to keep striving to reach higher levels. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm grateful to be able to play a part in that as well and to carry the legacy on. And it's helpful just to have that context reminder too, to know even just what we're doing now and how much growth we've had as a society and as universities to be able to have those types of intersecting conversations and really think about ourselves as whole people. So. I'm so I think I hope some of the things I've said will be helpful to some people. And yeah. So but if Definitely. it's only one person, I said it's, I mean, I in a sense, I went to my mental health for one or two people. I went to mm-hmm. sleep medicine for one person. So yeah, if one person <laughs> benefits from this, I suppose it's good to try. Yeah, and I know that many, many have, and I think that will continue as well. So okay. thank you so much for joining the Addy Hour, your namesake podcast in a sense. <laughs> So it's, I'm grateful, and I know this is definitely going to bless a lot of people. Um, something that's it's been gratifying for me, and I always learn more every time I talk through these things with you, as surprising as that may seem to some. So yes, thank you. Great having you on the Addy Hour, and I hope that you all enjoy this episode and, and share it widely, because I think there's so many important things here that people will benefit from as well. Till next time.